this was the only thing uh, that we found that had any potential to work. So it was a one-shot deal and it had to work. That was a little bit on the scary part. It worked. Today, all the water from the underground mine is filtered through these tanks, each containing about 20,000 pounds of Pseudomonas bacteria attached to plastic discs. Now, the bacteria like to attach to things, and they have a little tail that they use to propel themselves around in the water. They'll discard the tail and secrete a slime layer, which is how they attach to the plastic disc. So as the disc rotates very slowly, about one and a half revolutions per minute, uh, partially submerged in the water tank, the bacteria are attached to the disc. So they're in the water, and then they're back in the air, and then they're in the water. So when they're in the air, this helps satisfy their oxygen requirement. And when they're in the water then, uh, they're actually uh, picking up cyanide and absorbing metals. Every day, four million gallons of clean water pours out of the treatment plant and into the Whitewood Creek. Once the plant went online in 1984, within six months, there were fish moving into the stream. Fish, of course, are the best chemists of all. You can't fool them. It's either okay for them or it isn't. Meet the canaries of the Homestake gold mine. Before the water goes through the pipe and into the creek, trout kept at the treatment plant give the final approval. The fish were happy. The pseudomonas had plenty to eat as they broke down the cyanide for food. The bookkeepers were happy, too. We were uh, looking at a process, chemical process that would probably have cost us three to four million dollars a year for chemicals and, and operation. And we ended up with a biological process that cost us approximately a half million dollars a year to operate. Today, the ore blasted out of the earth provides work for a thousand local residents and uncounted trillions of bacteria. The result is a thousand bars of gold a year. For me to come back home where I grew up and be part of a team that, that cleaned up an area and completely changed an area, um, it was very rewarding, particularly because it was at home. today and see whether or not your antibiotics have worked. One in ten adults has okay. ulcer disease, and it's not stress-related. Okay. Now we know the true cause. Helicobacter pylori, a spiral-shaped, slow-acting bacterium that thrives in the stomach. Simple tests will detect H. pylori, and antibiotic treatment can begin. Very good. We have our first sample. I think it's an incredible discovery. I mean, that we've, we've actually been able to come so far in, in where we are with ulcer disease because for so long it was thought that you needed to get rid of the acid. So the surgery was taking out the acid um, part of the stomach, making it so that the acid decreased, and also taking out that area where the ulcer is uh, formed primarily. But now we know that it's just a bacterial disease, and all you have to do is just take a seven-day or ten-day course of antibiotics and it's over. It's great. Occasionally, the first course of antibiotics does not cure a patient. Then an endoscopy is done. A tissue sample will be taken to rule out other causes or confirm that H. pylori is present. My dad uh, had ulcer disease all of his life, and, and really it wasn't until probably about five years ago that he was tested for Helicobacter pylori and said he never felt better in his life just because he got treated and he was cured. Now we're entering into the small intestine. The first portion. Helicobacter pylori has affected more than just ulcer disease. Now scientists are studying the link between bacteria and many chronic illnesses like asthma, periodontal disease, hardening of the arteries, Crohn's disease, colitis, rheumatoid arthritis, and even some cancers. If even one of these diseases proves to be caused by bacteria, uh, and thus goes from the incurable or uh, the, where the, the cure is, is a very radical and, and unacceptable to many patients, take it off that list and put it on the list of 
diseases that can be readily cured by antibiotics, um, that would be a major contribution. This is the Institute for Genomic Research, or TIGER. Here they pull out a bacterium's genetic blueprint, its DNA, and break it into chunks that a supercomputer pieces together. If the whole DNA is the book describing a bacterium, the genes are the pages. The computers put the pages in the right order. I mean, what we actually see is a couple million letters of A, C, G's, and T's. I mean, that's the genetic code. That's what we determine when we actually determine the sequence of the genome, is, is the order of the, uh, of the letters. The real task is in interpreting what that means, you know, what, what words, what sentences, what messages are there. And this, we're finding some phenomenal uh, messages hidden in there. The things that are pre-programmed into these genomes is, uh, I mean, it, it, it's absolutely amazing. In each one of these genomes that we do, it increases our ignorance quotient quite substantially. Once the genetic blueprints of microorganisms are completed, the functions of the genes are studied. As researchers understand which genes are responsible for growth or disease, they can be manipulated for many purposes. And it's given us insight into a much larger question. We, we like to think that we're highly evolved and therefore our chromosomes are probably highly evolved uh, and bacteria are primitive. Well, in fact, the opposite is true. The bacterial chromosomes are very highly evolved. Uh, if you think of organisms that replicate every 20 minutes to an hour and they've been doing that for billions of years, they've gotten very efficient at everything they do. So there's, there's no wasted letters in their alphabet. Essentially, they're wall-to-wall -wall genes for all practical purposes. Understanding the genes of microorganisms also opens up thousands of new targets for antibiotics, vaccines, and industrial applications. It's amazing the diversity that's out there. We, we know a tiny fraction of 1% of what's out there. And the smartest thing we could do in this research is, you know, go try and find new ways to cult culture thousands and thousands of new microorganisms and find out their genetic code and find out what's there. It's going to revolutionize uh, virtually everything we do. Yellowstone National Park is one of the richest places on Earth for all microbial life. Bacteria thrive in the extreme conditions found in the pools. Tourists see the spectacular scenery. Researchers come to understand how life can survive. Many of the organisms that live in, this po in these pools uh, have to eat. So those are called heterotrophs. So they have to consume things in their environment. And in order for a microbe to consume something in its environment, it has to make an enzyme that can break that particular item down. Well, if we see a piece of wood in this hot pool and we pull it out and we see that the outside of that piece of wood is bleached white, you automatically ask the question, how did that happen? So when we look at the microbes associated with that wood, studies have shown that these microbes have that capacity because we've cloned the genes from these organisms that encode those particular enzymes and have found that, in fact, they are adapted to breaking down these wood fibers under these extreme conditions. By cloning the genes that produce whitening enzymes, they can turn it out in quantity. That means paper companies can use bacterial enzymes to whiten paper and lessen the need for chlorine. It's good for the environment and it's big business. Enzyme production is an $11.5 billion a year industry. Most antibiotics come from bacteria living in the soil. As the search for new antibiotics continues, scientists are learning just how little we know about the microbial life beneath our feet. To microbiologists, the Earth is the richest source of, of new biology that there is because there's far more that we haven't studied than that we have already discovered. In a teaspoonful of soil, there are at least a billion bacteria that we can grow in culture. But there are many, many more bacteria, perhaps a hundred times as many, that can't grow on our culture media. And in fact, we've probably been studying only a tiny portion of the organisms that actually live in soil based on their ability to grow on our petri plates. 
But if the bacteria won't grow in the lab, how do you find out what they can do? How do you test them? Start with the soil. One of the things we've been doing is extracting the genes from the bacteria directly without culturing them first, just pulling their DNA out directly from the soil and then sequencing pieces of that DNA to describe the organisms that are in that soil. And using that methodology, we find that most of the organisms in the soil have not yet been described. The search for new microbial life has taken researchers from backyard soil to the ocean floor to the heavens. A meteorite from Mars has fossilized structures that look suspiciously like small bacteria. Scientists are coming to the conclusion that life may be far more common in the universe than we had supposed. Anywhere that there is liquid water, there is a possibility of life, and we know that here on Earth, that's just a fundamental requirement. And in fact, anywhere on Earth where there is liquid water, you find there is life. And so the fact that on planets such as on Mars, where you might have hydrothermal features under some of the uh, ice flows uh, that might make liquid water is very exciting. The experts say this is the beginning of the golden age of microbiology. Industry, medicine, the definition of life itself are all being changed by single-celled creatures you and I can't even see. Everyone should look at pond water at least a few times a year if you're a microbiologist because now the days of technology and, and DNA and, uh, and high-tech things it is nice to go look in a microscope every once in a while and look at that life and that diversity of life because you can't just put it in a, a vacuum or, or look at it as a bunch of, uh, of A's, T's, G's, and C's and a chromosome. This, this, is not, this is not life in itself. So you should go look at pond water. Everyone should look at pond water and, and they will, they'll understand in that instant is more about uh, a feeling about what life is than, uh, than almost any other kind of experience they could have.